Until this happens, they fear there will be little incentive for the industry to do whatever's necessary to reduce sea lice to the level when wild fish won't be infected. And in the offices of the Scottish executive in Edinburgh, you hear the same argument, that there's not enough evidence to blame fish farms. What I am uh, not prepared to accept is that there's an absolute proven causal link between these two. The fact that the actual outflow of those rivers happens to coincide uh, with, with, with deep water that is appropriate for salmon farming, I'm not prepared to accept that, that these two have been firmly established. For scientists like James Butler, waiting vainly for his salmon to return, that statement is frustrating. His work has led him to the opposite conclusion, and he knows his reasoning is even supported by government scientists. All we are doing is, is what the government has tried to do in the past, but their scientists have been hushed up, and we're just repeating the work, and we, we float it out in the public, and um, it's either hushed up, or as I say, discredited, um, or just completely ignored and hope that it'll go away. But I'm afraid it won't, and, and to the best of our abilities, we'll carry on putting this information out. The suggestion that government scientists have been hushed up and forbidden to talk about the threat posed by sea lice from fish farms has been widely rumoured. Andy Walker is a biologist with the government's freshwater fisheries laboratory. When we went to interview him, he was trawling Loch Shieldig for sea lice larvae, attended at a distance by two minders from the information department. We knew that Dr. Walker and other colleagues had long suspected that salmon farms play a part in the decline of wild fish. We'd also heard that he'd been leaned on not to voice his suspicions. Everything suggested that lengthy discussions with the minders were supposed to determine what Dr. Walker might and might not say and that he was under considerable pressure. Was he going to speak his mind? I think there's a lot of conjecture about this, and there's a widespread view that many of the sea lice are coming from fish farms, because there are many salmonid fish in fish farms which have parasites on them, have the sea lice on them. Now, the fish farmers are waging a war against these lice to try to eradicate them, and the wild fish interests are desperate that they should win this war. So we think that it's certainly part of the problem that the mortality of the, the wild fish is created by lice emanating from fish farms. But we're trying to work together with them to solve the problem. We would have liked to have had traps in a number of rivers and get hard information on, on numbers of fish traveling up and down. This should have been addressed a long time ago, but money is always scarce and people have to compete for their resources. And it's the case that it's only when things become really serious that uh, the, the money gets diverted to these, these situations. We asked Dr. Walker whether resources are now sufficient. That, that's certainly not something I um, could give a view on camera about. Um, I don't think I could even give a very good view anyway. Uh, it's, it's such a wide question. Uh, somebody higher has to make decisions on this. I don't I think that's... Um something we can really... No way. Drink. No. I'm sure you guys will assess that at the end of the programme. When our researcher spoke to a press officer in the marine laboratory, he was told, and I quote, if Andy Walker says anything about what impacts he believes salmon farms is having on wild salmon stocks, he'll be out of a job. And another scientist I cannot name said, it is widely known that fish farms are involved and to pretend otherwise is a sheer farce. They are leaning on me to say nothing. If you're suggesting to me that there are people out there, I think this is the serious allegation yeah. that you're making and that you are putting in, in, in here, that there are people actively leaning on scientists to tell uh, untruths about the state of sea lice. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, there is a problem. I don't, I'm not aware of anyone in my department who has ever hidden from that. Uh, and it's certainly not a matter of our policy. The Scottish executive has made a further statement saying the issue remains inconclusive and that government scientists are constrained by the same conduct as other civil servants. They also make clear that they've launched a range of initiatives to improve understanding of sea lice and how they can be better controlled. These include a scheme where fish farms enter into voluntary agreements with wild fish interests to eradicate sea lice and preserve wild stocks. So far, 
few such agreements have been made. It's all very different in Norway, where half the world's farm salmon is produced. Solveig Nygaard is a veterinary inspector who makes regular statutory reports on levels of sea lice on fish farms. Any farm breaching the limit is forced to de-louse. The threat that sea lice pose to wild fish is accepted at the highest levels of Norwegian government. Yeah, they, they, it's, that's undoubtedly, it's true. It has, has been and can be a reservoir for, for sea lice. And the sea lice can uh, be transferred to the wild salmon and, and uh, make a threat to the wild salmon stock. That's, that's not uh, being discussed. There's, the challenge with us is how to reduce that problem. The Norwegian solution of open government and strong regulation seems to be working. New research shows that levels of sea lice infection are falling among both farmed and wild fish. But the spread of parasites is only one of the problems facing aquaculture. Vets like Solveig are discovering that many fish in the cages suffer the consequences of industrial husbandry. Cataract, causing blindness, is just one of many health problems resulting from ever more intensive production. The objective is always to bring the fish to market weight in the shortest possible time. In just a few years, their growth rate has been massively increased. The better they are growing, the better is the welfare of them. And we will also see that uh, with good growth, you will have a healthy fish. Because what we should keep in mind is that when they are growing well, they get well-balanced feed, and that has a direct impact also on the health status. So they are better protected against diseases. To achieve their results, aquaculturalists manipulate everything, feeding regimes, temperature, light levels, and genetic selection. But as a result, do salmon suffer stress? There's no doubt that salmon are sophisticated animals. And there's big gaps in our knowledge about, for example, their pain perception. We don't know very much there. How do you know that farm salmon are suffering with stress? I mean, what, what are the signs and symptoms? Well, I think we have seen in, in recent years a number of, of diseases that we could call productional diseases. That is kind of man-made diseases made through the way we, we handle these fish and the way we farm them. Diseases that we're talking about, these are mostly bacterial or viral infections, are they? There are some bacterial, some viral, and some parasitological diseases, yes. Cataract is very common. I mean, the fish are blind? The fish are more or less blind, exactly. These diseases are a direct result of, it, of intensification? Well, we see the diseases in wild fish as well, but, but never to such an extent and such seriousness as in, in farming conditions, because the farming condition itself caters, in a way, for, for infectious diseases to occur. You have lots of fish in a very concentrated area. What about the fish we've got here? Well, these are, these are supposed to be Atlantic salmon, but as you see, they look maybe more like uh, carp or something. They are, but these are ordinary farmed Atlantic salmon with a condition we call humpback. And we believe that uh, high temperature during incubation of the egg cell is an important factor in producing these fish. And of course, the fish farmers will, d will increase the temperature to, to speed up the development from egg to, to smolts. What percentage of fish might you find with these kind of gross malformations? Well, this malformation has become very common in Norway in recent years. And we have seen that in, well, 50, 60, 70 percent in, in some cases, but 20 percent is fairly ordinary. You're saying up to 70 percent of the fish? Yes, these fish are from a particular farm where at the present time 70 percent of the fish have different types of, of back formations. Can the salmon be pushed even further? The farmers, they, they need to make money because it, this is tough competition, worldwide competition. So, so we are definitely pressing the fish and, and kind of, in a way, we are not considering them as, as biological individuals. These are more like nails or cars or whatever. So they're being treated more like sort of goods on a production line? These are definitely goods on the production line, yes. Not all salmon farms produce monsters. 
As always, the worst cases cast a shadow over the rest. But industry leaders do recognize a problem and put it down to inexperience. Due to the fact that this is a young industry and that we are learning through research every day new things, we can come into situations like this. But it is not something we want. The young industry has had many unwanted experiences. From the beginning, it's been devastated by disease furunculosis, bacterial kidney disease, vibriosis, and most recently ISA, infectious salmon anemia, have all caused serious losses, in some years accounting for half of the fish in the cages. Although these epidemics have now largely been contained, millions of fish died or had to be slaughtered, and it's very likely that new diseases will appear. Is this ethical? As a veterinarian, I really dislike the way these salmon look, and I dislike the fact that we are actually producing these fish. They really deserve better. But again, we don't have tradition for fish as farm animals. And the Animal Welfare Act is kind of insufficient when it comes to, to dealing with modern fish farming. Other legislation may also be insufficient. In the pristine waters of Scottish lochs, this build-up of fish wastes, of feces and uneaten food beneath salmon cages is not only offensive, it can cause major ecological damage. Nor does it do much good for the fish in the cages above. As a result, fish farmers now practice fallowing. They leave the cages empty or fallow once the mature fish have been harvested. As part of the huge Nutrico group, Marine Harvest Scotland is regarded as an industry leader, using the most up-to-date farming techniques. I visited one of its farms, where it's claimed that the regular practice of fallowing allows waste materials to be dispersed by currents and tides. This, says Managing Director Graham Deer, helps safeguard the health of the fish. About five, just over five kilos. Yeah. In very, very good condition. As you can see, there's hardly a marker, not a marker on it at all. Oh, we've never denied, I mean, the cages that we see before us, they have an impact, but the impact is underneath the cages. Right. And it's the same in any walk of life. You build a house, you change whatever it is. A farmer plows a field, he changes whatever it is. And we have an impact. The good thing is that it's an organic impact which can regenerate. It can return to its normal state. And that's why I would quite like to see a system which would allow us on a routine basis to move the cages from the present location, just up the loch, and that area would regenerate. So I don't think that we have anything to fear. Very, very good condition. So uh, I think I'd quite like to put it back now in somebody's plate tomorrow. Here on the east coast of Canada, at a site where water flow is more restricted, there's a long-term study to determine the impact of salmon farms on the seabed. Fish farms in Lime Kiln Bay produce a half million kilos of salmon a year, with the resulting deposits of feces and waste food. Dr. Gerhard Pohl studied the rate of dispersal of the waste and what changes occurred. We look particularly at the animals that live on the bottom because they are very diverse, they're many different kinds, but mostly because they don't have a choice to move away. They have to stay within the area. They have to face the conditions. We took samples from the bottom of the sea. We did this once a year, over five years, in the middle of the bay. We did this deliberately to minimize the effects of any particular cage on the samples. So we think what we measured here are the impacts for the region as a whole, rather than of a particular cage site. We found 50 to 60 different kinds of species. We found at least a dozen less the next year. But it isn't just the species themselves, it's also the abundances. The whole community structure changed. Those species that disappeared from 94 to 95 have never reappeared again. This seems to indicate that it takes a rather long time for the animals to be able to recover. These crustaceans, these amphipods and cumaceans have drastically reduced in abundance. The analogy is a little bit like a house of cards. Once you start taking cards away, at one point the whole house will fall. But I think at this point we are raising a warning flag that this is happening. And if we don't 
stop it.